All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have another session today, and uh, where, um, speaker of t today will be Brian. I'm sure that uh, most of you already know Brian quite well, but uh, just a short introduction. Uh, Brian is a project editor, research analyst at BC. Uh, he was previously a United States Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, he enjoys writing, uh, philosophy, music, and as you can see, he has a uh, quite nice beer. <laughs> okay, and uh, Brian is fascinated by the uh, power of language and uh, is passionate about words. And he is a uh, leader of one of our BC Greens clusters called Wordplay, uh, because we know that words are the basis for written communications, and it's very important uh, to be able to uh, not just to speak, but also write uh, our thoughts. Thoughts today, Brian will uh, give us an overview about how English developed uh, from a relatively obscure Germanic language to the global language as we know it today, and uh, he will share with us some insights into why English has some of the oddest uh, it does in spelling and pronunciations. So uh, we, I would like to welcome uh, Brian and uh, looking forward to hear a great speech. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Colleen. That was a very lovely introduction. And thanks to everyone for being here. Um, welcome today to the very short history of the English language. And we are just going to jump right into it today. We have about 1,500 years of history to cover in about 25 minutes. So we need to get going. Um, that being said, um, I thought it might be nice to start off with, uh, it's a thing that's been circulating the internet called English is a crazy language. Maybe you've seen it. Um, I don't know if you have. I thought it's kind of cute, but it explains some of the strange things that are in the English language in a very cute way. So um, what we have here is an eggplant and well, there is no egg in an eggplant. There's no ham in a hamburger. There's not a pine or an apple in pineapple. And the English muffin isn't from England. And that's right, French fries are from, you guessed it, Belgium. Uh, quicksand can actually work very slowly. A boxing ring is actually square. A guinea pig is not from Guinea, nor is it a pig. Writers write, but fingers don't fing, and hammers don't ham. We count one tooth, two teeth, one goose, two geese, but we go one moose, two moose. And if teachers taught, why didn't preachers prot? And perhaps the most interesting question, if vegetarians eat vegetables, what exactly do humanitarians eat? In English, we recite at a play and we play at a recital. We send a shipment by truck, but we send cargo by ship. Noses run and feet smell. A slim chance and a fat chance are the same, but a wise man and a wise guy are opposites? Your house can burn up at the same time it burns down. You fill in a form by filling it out, and an alarm goes off by going on. Now, you don't have to be a native speaker or a foreign speaker to realize these things that happen in the English language and probably think something like this. Uh, I know when I think about it, the, these little oddities, I, I think the same thing, and I think about why they are the way that they are. Well, in order to get into that, we need to understand a little bit about how English developed and a little bit of the history behind the English language. Um, as you can see here, this is the Indo-European family tree. And over here on the right hand side, we've got the happy little English branch. Um, because English is part of the Indo-European family language, it means that English is closely related to Dutch and German. It's more distantly related to the Romance languages of Spanish, French, Italian, Romanian, and Portuguese. Uh, most especially French, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, also, the Slavic languages, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, and Czech, um, and the other Slavic languages are also related to English. I, I know it may not be intuitive, but they are. Um, even more distantly, English is related to Albanian and Celtic, and way, way, way off on the other side of the family tree, English is actually related to Persian and Hindi. Uh, you might ask yourself uh, how we know these things, um, it's because of the work of linguistics, um, which is the study of language and how it developed. Um, 
what linguists do when they're when they're studying how languages are related is they consider, of course, uh, geography um, and history, but they also study uh, things that are the same: syntax, uh, grammar, vocabulary. Uh, that are similar in languages and they make inferences. While it's not an exact science, um, it, everything tends to point to, to this relationship between, the, between languages. Um, so when they study words, uh, they study simple words that you first learn when you're, when you're growing up. Uh, things like mother, father, uh, counting, one, two, three. Uh, they examine words that are similar in languages and they make inferences. And they also look back into history into different texts. Um, so when you look back at English and, and the development of the language, um, there are four main periods of English. Um, the first is Old English, which is roughly the year 449 to 1066. Um, it's epitomized by the, the epic poem Beowulf. Uh, you may have seen the not so great movie uh, of the same name that's based on the epic poem. Uh, this, what you see on your screen is an example of uh, the, the poem Beowulf in its original script. Uh, the next period of English is called Middle English. It's from roughly 1066 to 1485. Um, and the greatest piece of literature there was uh, the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer in the late 1300s. And this is how English had looked at that point. Uh, this is from the Prior's Tale, if I'm not mistaken. Then we get into more modern English. Early modern English is 14, roughly 1485 to 1800. Um, and it's characterized by Shakespeare, and it's often referred to as Elizabethan English because it is uh, Queen Elizabeth was the, the main queen during, during this time period, along with uh, the time of Shakespeare. Uh, here we see an example from Hamlet of uh, Shakespeare. And finally, we get into late modern English, which is roughly 1800 to present. Um, this is uh, characterized by you know, modern authors, relatively modern authors, such as Hemingway, Eliot, and Whitman, and we can see an example, a wonderful example of modern English, late modern English on the BFC website, of course. Now, when you're thinking about English, it's important to realize that these years that are here, the 449 to 1066, 1066 to 1485, it's not like a English, just stop being old English in 1066 and everyone said, okay, now we're gonna speak middle English. You have to realize that these things develop over time and these are just rough guidelines. Uh, you'll see what happened in 1066, and in the uh, the 1400s that led uh, linguists to give these as approximate dates. Um, so before we actually start talking about Old English, we need to know what was happening before English. I and mean, 449 is still relatively new. People were speaking long before then. So what was going on in England before Old English? Uh, English England was actually inhabited by uh, the Iberians or the Bell Beaker culture. Um, and you can kind of see they, they tended to flock around uh, different areas around the sea, around rivers. Um, and this was roughly 2,500 before the Common Era. Uh, after the Iberians, there was a Celtic invasion. Uh, the Celtics, this was about the year 600 uh, to 500 before the Common Era. Uh, and they came and they still have their culture alive in many parts of uh, the, the British Isles today. Uh, in 550 BCE, the Roman invasion uh, under Julius Caesar came and invaded England. And although they invaded England, it, England was not made part of the empire at that point. Uh, they paid tribute for about 90 years or so. Um, they officially became part of the empire under Emperor Claudius in 43, uh, in the Common Era. And they stayed there for 200 to 300, 250 to 350 years. Uh, Britain, uh, Romans, excuse me, did withdraw from, from Britain, from England, uh, sometime between 300 and 400 BC, or excuse me, uh, in the Common Era. Um, they withdrew mostly because they needed to uh, concentrate on fighting threats uh, coming from other places, mostly Germanic tribes trying to invade the empire, uh, what they termed barbarians. Um, there's still a remnant of uh, Roman culture in England today. We see the, the bathhouses, Roman bathhouses, and there's also Hadrian's Wall, which doesn't look the same now, but you can still see remnants of it in England. Uh, we're starting to get a little bit into English history and away from English language history, so uh, we'll leave that for uh, another day. Um, if we move on, the next major event that developed the, the development of the uh, English language was the Anglo-Saxon invasion, or what's frequently called the Anglo-Saxon invasion. 
Um, as you can see on the map here, we have uh, people coming from what is modern uh, Denmark. Um, they were called Norse at the time, or we, we refer to them as Norse rather. Uh, you can see they're coming to, um, after the, the Roman Empire left, uh, coming to sack, pillage, and, and take back home uh, what they could find in, in England. And eventually, instead of going and stealing stuff and taking it back home, they decided it would be better just to set up a new home there. Um, what this means is that they started to develop their own culture separately from the, the culture that it is in uh, what's modern day Denmark. Uh, along with that culture became a different language. Now, while it's not exactly the same, um, I wanted to take a listen to uh, modern Frisian language, uh, which is roughly about where this says key right here. This is the closest modern language to Old English. And while it's not the same, I think it's interesting to listen to. You'll hear an introduction from a guy named Michael Palin, and then you'll hear uh, the actual modern Frisian, which is somewhat like what the Angles and Saxons were speaking. In Friesland, many people start their day listening to the weather forecast from popular weatherman Pete Palusma. Some of his words might sound familiar, like three and four. Frost and freeze. The temperature is under by the three or the four degrees. Not frost. It will not freeze. Now, as you can see, um, there are some words in modern Frisian which are very close to uh, what are in English, and it's actually true of Old English as well. Um, so, when we start talking about Old English, I thought it would be good to give an example of a text that's actually still used today, but we can look at it and listen to it in Old English. Um, the reason I chose this particular text, like I said, it's, it's still used in English today, and it's actually used in a lot of different languages all over the world. It's been translated, and I'm not going to tell you what it is right now, but we'll, we'll see if you can guess it. Um, so let's take a look and a, a listen uh, to an example of Old English. Fader ure, tu the er ton hevnum, si vin nama ya hargot, to be kumma din richa, you were that in will, on air than swaswa on heaven. You're not yet a one leak on the laugh, said a us today. On for evus, you're a guilt us. Swaswa way for evat, you're a guilt endum. On the lad to us on costnunger, ak alisus a vigla, such a now, I know what you're thinking at this point. Brian, I understood every single word that was going on. What's the difference between this and, and modern English? Uh, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, this seems like a very strange, very foreign, very weird language to English today, and it is. Um, this is actually what's called the Lord's Prayer, um, and that's the reason I, I chose the text, because a lot of people know it. In Romanian, it's Tato Nostru, uh, for those of you in the Moldovan office. Um, and I'll just do the first few lines in modern English, which would be, Our Father, who art in heaven, uh, hallowed be thy name. Um, so while it may seem like there's not a lot of commonalities between this very strange Old English and modern English, you can actually see some things. Words down here like we, us, of, and. We even have heaven right here. And here we had the words to and day. Um, today we put them together to into one word, but you have two day. Um, so it's a very different, very strange language to us, but there's still a lot of words and uh, a lot of sounds that we still use today, um, even if we don't understand the entire syntax of it. Um, English next evolved into the Middle English period, as I mentioned before, uh, largely because of an event called the Norman invasion in 1066. Um, what happened in 1066 was really interesting for English history, but also the English language history. Um, in 1066, on January 5th, King Edward the Confessor dies. Uh, this normally isn't a problem, except for he didn't have any heirs to the throne of England. And uh, depending on who you talk to, either he didn't specifically name anyone, or he named, gave a couple people, told a couple different people that they could be kings, or the next king of England. Uh, what ends up happening is Harold Godwinson becomes king, and he has three main people challenging him for the throne. One is his brother, uh, Tostig Godwinson, and the other is the king of Norway, whose name I can't really pronounce very well, um, but it's also not important. 
Um, Harold defeats both of them on uh, September 20th of 1066 at the Battle of Stanford Bridge, leaving only one other person as a claim to his throne, who is William, uh, the Duke of Normandy. Uh, he argued with Harold um, about who was the rightful king of England, and on October 14th of 1066, during the Battle of Hastings, William defeated uh, Harold, and Harold was killed which means that William, uh, the Duke of Normandy, became King of England. Now, you may be asking yourself why this is important for uh, the developments of the English language. Uh, the main reason is that William, being from Normandy, spoke French. Um, and as you'll see, um, that had an amazing influence on the English language. Because, Woy uh, because William uh, spoke French, he brought with him lords and ladies, and his entire aristocracy was French-speaking. So what it became was English became a peasant language and French was the language of the aristocrats, the bureaucrats. This ended up having a big effect on English because a lot of new words came into the, the language, words like uh, bishop and castle, words in general that the aristocracy would use uh, for legal things such as magistrate uh, came from that French of the time. Uh, the other effect that it had was it's uh, peasants who tended to work with in the fields with animals, uh, continued using the English names for things, things like pig and cow, whereas the aristocracy, who were mainly French speaking, um, didn't work in the fields. They worked with the, the products that came from the fields, the meat that came to the table. Um, so they didn't eat pig, they ate pork. They didn't eat cow, they ate beef. Um, today we ha still have this distinction. We call the animals pig and cow, and we call the meats pork and beef. Uh, the other thing that happened, uh, Another quick example of this was um, words became that were in Old English became more particular when they were replaced uh, by words from the French of the time. Uh, one example that comes to mind when I was studying at Iowa State was uh, a professor gave the example of the word apple. Um, apparently, in, in Old English, meant more than just uh, the fruit that we know of as, as today, but it meant more like fruit in general. Uh, when French came along, it had its word for fruit, so apple became something much more specific. Um, so let's actually uh, get into an example of, of Middle English here, and this is going to be from uh, the Canterbury Tales by, by Geoffrey Chaucer. And let's just take a quick look and listen. We won't listen to the whole thing, we'll just listen to uh, a part of it. I'll, I'll stop it. But you'll see that it's much more closer to modern English. One that April, with his sure is sort of the draught of March has pierced to the rota, and bathed every vine in switch liqueur, of which thereto engendered is the fruit. When Zephyrus, eke with his sweeter breath, in spirit hath in every halt and heath the tender croppes, and the younger sonna hath in the ram his halva cosi romna. Now you notice that this looks a lot more English than the previous text. Um, even though there's some spelling differences and the pronunciation is still very different. Uh, one of the things you may notice is, is that the, the final E is still being pronounced on a lot of words, whereas today we have what's referred to as the silent E um, in modern English. And when you look at this, you see a lot of words that are either the same or similar. Um, when, April, his, um, coming down here, young, son, um, every, in, I mean, this looks like a very English text. Um, in fact, if you were to look at the whole text, you you would see the connections with, with English that you don't see when you look at an old English text. Um, even though if you were to read it, you would probably get very lost. I, as a native English speaker, cannot read Middle English and make a lot of sense of it. I have to have help um, when I do that. Um, so now as we start transitioning to uh, early modern English, uh, there was one key event that lasted a long time um, that it's said to be the transition between the two. And this has a lot of the explanation of, for why English is the way it is today and why it's kind of that quirky, strange language. Um, and that's referred to as the great vowel shift. Um, I'm not gonna get super in depth to, uh, into it uh, because I don't think it's necessary, but it happened in about eight phases at the end of the Middle English period and the beginning of the early modern period. Um, people started pronouncing the vowels differently. So if we look at this chart here that's on the table, if uh, you think of this as your throat, 
Uh, the top part is the top of your throat, the bottom part's the bottom. This little slanted part in front is the, the front of your throat, and this straight line here is the back of your throat. Um, since you all have your microphones muted, I believe, feel free to say this out loud. Um, when we go through, uh, we'll do a couple of examples. You can actually feel how the vowel hits in different places of the throat. So if we say thief and five, you can actually feel the, the thief hitting in the top part, uh, top front part of the throat, whereas the five, excuse me, the five is uh, much deeper. We see a similar thing. You can hear the this sound going up from sueta to sweet, sweet, sweet. Um, if we go to the back of the throat, it's we see the same sort of thing. Uh, we go from hoos to house, hoos house, or um, we can move up from foda to food, foda food. Um, and here's a chart, uh, just a few more examples. So we go from uh, beat to bite, uh, mate to meat. Uh, over here we have uh, mat, mata, nama to mate and name. And we also have oot and hoos becoming out and house and boat becoming boot. Um, it seems like a silly thing to happen that, that this pronunciation is what's called the great vowel shift would happen, but it actually happens in a lot of languages. Um, and while no one's sure exactly why it happens, uh, the, the leading theory and the, and the one that makes most sense to me is that at about the time the great vowel shift was happening, there were lots of people that were moving around the country, moving from northern and, and middle England and coming into southern England, uh, especially London. Um, this means that different people came into contact with each other um, and people started to want to have a way to distinguish themselves for people, other people that they consider to be of lower status. And this is something that still happens today. For example, if you're in America uh, and you want to be on television, chances are you want to speak more like the way that I do as opposed to someone from the South um, because it, it's considered, uh, often considered rightly, or excuse me, wrongly um, as conveying a little bit more intelligence. And these are just the biases that come in when we're, we're thinking about these things. Um, so if we move on to early modern English, we're, I want to listen to one example from here. And, oops, excuse me. This is actually from um, Shakespeare. To bear or not to bear, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the things in arts of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sad troubles and by opposing and to die. To slip no more, and by a slip to say we end the heart in a thousand natural shocks that flesh is it. So as you can see, by the time we get to early modern English, this is a very English text. It's easily recognizable as English. There's some spelling differences. There's still some pronunciation differences, um, but it's clearly a, I would say an older style of modern English, um, and I can read Shakespeare with no troubles. It's very, something that's very easy to understand what's going on. Uh, the main influence in early modern English is, of course, Shakespeare. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about him. Um, his writings greatly influenced the entire English language. Um, he's contributed to the standardization of the languages and as many as 1,700 words and phrases in the English language today can be contributed to Shakespeare. Now, if you can imagine that, that's roughly 10% of a person's vocabulary um, that might be cons uh, considered influenced by Shakespeare or, or even created by Shakespeare. Um, he created new words by changing nouns into verbs and verbs into adjectives, connecting words in different ways, adding prefixes and suffixes, and just creating whole new words, which is stuff that we still do today uh, with our language. Um, if we go to the, the late modern period, I don't think there's a need to listen to, to this. It's just modern English as the way it is. I think everyone who speaks English well enough to understand it can understand this language. Um, this is just an example from Robert F. Kennedy's speech on uh, April 5th, 1968. Um, so obviously late modern English is the English we use today. And let's just take a quick look at how that looks. Um, there are currently at least 250,000 words in the English language, which is incredible. The average person, the average native speaker, uses somewhere between 15 and 23,000 words as part of their active vocabulary. 
and no is anywhere between 35,000 and 40,000 words. So as you can see, there's a ton of words that even I don't know. Um, and if you include uh, technical words, scientific words, medical words, pharmaceutical words, there could be up to a million words in the English language. Uh, so we have an incredibly rich language. Um, word formation comes from changing uh, grammar, for example, a noun to a verb. Uh, one most recent example of this was uh, if you take a look at the website Google and the, the company Google, um, in 2006, this actually became an official verb in the English language. For example, uh, if my wife asks me a question and I don't know the answer, I don't tell her to go search it on the internet, I tell her to Google it. Um, another common way is compounding words, which comes from our German root. Uh, this is uh, words, if you think like a uh, place where you park your car becomes a car park. Um, if you're not feeling well because you miss your home, you're homesick. And then um, asphyxiation or prefixes and suffixes. Um, if you take a word like moral, and then you can use it as morally, immoral, amoral, et cetera. And lots of languages do, do that as well. Um, in modern English today, uh, most of our words come from either French or uh, German uh, roots. Uh, so from Old English, Old Norse, uh, even some Dutch and some Old German words, and then uh, Latinate words mostly came from, from France. Um, the other thing is now English used to borrow a lot of words, and now we're actually lending words to other languages, uh, mostly through film, uh, television, newspapers, um, music, uh, whatever media work comes from the English-speaking world out into the, the other world, those uh, new words quickly get picked up. Um, by other languages. Now, obviously, modern English is a very global language. Um, if you look at this map, you can see that English is a primary or secondary language in a large portion of the world. Um, in fact, English has 350 to 365 million native speakers, um, which is third in the world. I believe these stats were from 2010. Um, Mandarin Chinese has the most native speakers and Spanish the second most native speakers. But when you take into account uh, how many speakers we have as a secondary language, there are nearly 1 billion total speakers. And if you further add in people that speak English to some degree, it's estimated between 1.5 and 2 billion people uh, speak English to some degree in the world, which is incredible. That means that if you know English, you can travel basically anywhere in the world um, and be understood by someone somewhere. Um, obviously, it depends. You might have more trouble finding it in certain places. But uh, you know, I've traveled quite a few different countries and never had a problem speaking English. Um, so that is English history, or the history of the English language in a very short period of, of time frame. So I wanted to thank you for your attention and for, for being here today. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'm not a linguist, um, but I do find the subject fascinating, and I hope you've uh, taken something from it as well. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, very much for such a great presentation. It was uh, interesting indeed, and uh, I'm sure every one of us uh, had the opportunity to learn something new. I mean, uh, speaking for my, myself, um, I'm very happy to, that there is English and that we can, it's a bridge for, for us to understand each other. Uh, thank you for everyone for participating. Uh, we, are, we have a couple more minutes left before the end so if there is we could go for one question if not as Brian advised uh, you could uh, write or contact Brian and um, he will be happy to answer your questions all right so um, officially we uh, end the this session and uh, looking forward for for our new um, Next, next uh, week, right? So, uh, please uh, visit uh, our uh, BC Green uh, website where you can learn more about uh, different clusters, and you can learn more about uh, um, Brian Cluster, uh, 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 yeah, wordplay. And uh, if you are interested to have your own cluster, feel free to contact uh, uh, Marina, uh, me. Uh, Maria, Ada Marina or Ryan, and you'll be uh, 
we will be very happy to have you there as well. Have a good day and uh, thank you.